Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 699 for May 20th, 2018. Coming up in a few minutes. Whiskey means something in a whole range of things, celebrating events like uh, weddings and uh, anniversaries. Uh, Whiskey at a wake is an important thing as well. The Irish still believe in the wake, spending a day or two days of uh, remembering the great, great qualities of somebody who just recently died and raise a glass to his memory. So whiskey is everywhere in Irish culture. Irish whiskey lost one of its longtime champions this week with the death of John Clement Ryan. He was the last member of the Power family to work in the Irish whiskey business and spent most of his career promoting Jameson Irish whiskey around the world for Irish distillers. Back in 2013, we sat down with the camera rolling for an interview at Castle Martyr Resort near Middleton. And that conversation is coming up later on Whiskey Cast in Depth. We'll also have the calendar of events, this week's Your Voice, my tasting notes, and we'll go behind the label too. That's all coming up on this edition of Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast, brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, no red breast. This is whiskey. Johnny Walker's Scotch whiskey. From this place and these people, I, Scotch Makers, creating the bold and complex flavour of Johnny Walker Black Label. Step right up. Let's get started with the week's news. It's brought to you by Highland Park. If you've been following the boom in whiskey auctions and collecting, it's probably no surprise that the million-dollar mark for an auction of a single bottle of whiskey has finally been broken. Not once, but twice. That feat happened on Friday at Bonhams in Hong Kong when one of the 12 1926 McAllen bottles with a special label by Sir Peter Blake brought a high bid of $1,014,422. Later in the day, though, one of the other 12 1926 McAllens with a special label by Valerio Adami broke that record. The winning bid, $1.1 million. The two sets of 12 bottles each were produced by the McAllen back in 1986 as corporate gifts. And Bonham's Asia head of fine wine and whiskey, Daniel Lamb, called them among the most significant whiskies produced in the 20th century. Now, if you're wondering where you heard about these whiskeys recently, we reported last month on the sale of one bottle from each set for $600,000 each at Le Clos in Dubai International Airport. The next Bonhams Whiskey auction is set for June 6th in Edinburgh, and their next Hong Kong auction is on August 17th. Meanwhile, let me run some names by you for a second. Jimmy and Eddie Russell of Wild Turkey. Chris Morris of Brown Foreman, Fred No of Jim Beam, and Steve Nally of the Bardstown Bourbon Company. All five of them are Bourbon Hall of Famers, so let's just stipulate that they know pretty much what they're doing when they're picking out barrels. They teamed up to pick single barrels of Wild Turkey, Old Forester, Makers 46, Knob Creek Rye, and Willet Family Reserve, That will be sold at the Angels Fair finale of the Kentucky Bourbon Affair in Louisville, June 9th. The proceeds from the Legends Select series and a special silent auction of vintage bottles that night will go to four Kentucky charities. The whiskeys will sell for between $100 and $200 a bottle each, with autographed complete sets available. Another bourbon project that's helping others, Heaven Hill has produced a special set of Evan Williams single barrel bottles dipped in pink wax. They're being sold for $75 each at Heaven Hill's Bourbon Heritage Center in Bardstown to raise money for the Cancer Center at Flaggett Memorial Hospital in Bardstown. On that note, shortly after we published our last episode Thursday, 
we received word that Tom Helt had passed away the previous night. Our pal Fred Minnick referred to Tom on Twitter as one of American whiskey's greatest consumers. Tom was more than that, though. He was passionate about whiskeys of all kinds and knew more about whiskey than a lot of professionals in the industry. He was always more than eager to share that knowledge and his whiskeys with anyone. Our condolences go out to his wife, Barb, the entire Helt family, and all of Tom's friends. Back in March, Fred Lang gave us a sneak preview of one of Douglas Lang & Company's upcoming releases. Again, we're being poetic and marketing-led because we're releasing a 10-year-old scallywag in human years. But, of course, we make reference to that in canine years. Uh, this would be a 70-year-old. Uh, <laughs> so we are waxing, not just in marketing speak, we're, ma mar we're, we're waxing quite uh, poetic in, the, in how we're managing some of the fun attributes all Scotch Whiskey Association uh, approved, and we're, um, we're looking forward to a lot of fun. Now that 70th anniversary edition of Scallywag 10 Years Old is out, it's a Speyside blended malt matured exclusively in ex-sherry casks, and as with all of the Scallywag editions, features the Lang family's Fox Terrier on the label. 4,500 bottles will be available with a recommended retail price of £50, around $67 a bottle. Balconis Distilling will be releasing its next batch of French Oak Single Malt this coming Thursday, May 24th, exclusively at the distillery in Waco, Texas. It's bottled at 59.9% ABV and will sell for $80 a bottle. One other note, Irish distillers put Redbreast Dream Cask on sale Saturday to members of the Birdhouse Club. Despite some early hiccups with the website, all 816 bottles sold out within the first day. For those of you who got one, let the gloating begin on social media, and please try to share some with your friends. Finally, one clarification from our last episode. I mentioned during our segment on the Indianapolis 500 that Crown Royal was one of the sponsors on 2016 winner Alexander Rossi's car, Crown Royal is actually one of the associate sponsors for all of the Andretti Autosport teams this season. You can keep up with the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Highland Park, the Orkney single malt with Viking Soul. If you haven't tried Highland Park's 17-year-old The Dark single malt yet, get your hands on some while you still can. The Dark was named the best single malt scotch 13 to 19 years old in the San Francisco World Spirits competition. And look for its counterpart, The Light, coming to a whiskey shop near you. Find out more at highlandparkwhiskey.com. Time now for the Whiskey Cast calendar of events. The big event this week is the Isla Festival of Malt and Music, which kicks off on Friday and runs through June 2nd on Isla. As part of the festival, the Whiskey Lounge has a series of tastings on a tall ship docked in Port Ellen during Phase Shield. You'll find links for the details on our calendar page at whiskeycast.com. And while Art Begg's Distillery Day wraps up the festival June 2nd, there are Art Begg Day events all over the world between May 31st and June 9th. And on the next island over, Jura Distillery is holding its annual Tasteable on May 31st. Whiskey Live Louisville is June 2nd, while the Kentucky Bourbon Affair is June 5th through the 10th in Louisville. The Whiskey Jubilee is June 7th in New York City. Whiskey Live Melbourne is June 8th and 9th in Australia. And the New York City Independent Spirits Expo is coming up June 11th. Right now, we have 313 different events on our searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. If you have a whiskey tasting, a festival, or other event coming up that you'd like whiskey lovers to know about, just use the searchable calendar on our website and let us know about it. This is whiskey. Johnny Walker Scotch whiskey. From this place, and these places in that place. These are the people that make it. 
This is what they sound like. Because you're a cheeky wee blighter. Dance like I, like that. This is what they do all day. Building the great character of Johnny Walker, Black Label. Aging hit Gain Oak for 12 long years. Thanks. Oh, it's gorgeous there. Oh. What is character? It's giving a damn. You're all right, lassie. Which looks like this, as much as this. See, the land that shapes these people and the people that shape this whiskey all shape how bloody good it tastes. Not the bloody game in the telly, Alan. A whiskey as bold as it is complex. For every step you take, this is Johnny Walker Black Label, friends. Step right up. Cut, cut. Can I drink this now? Johnny Walker Black Label Blended Scotch Whiskey. 40% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Lagavulin. Irish whiskey lost one of its legendary figures the other day with the death of John Clement Ryan at his home in Dublin. He was the last of seven generations of the Power family to work in the whiskey business and spent most of his career traveling the world to promote Jameson Irish whiskey. Back in the fall of 2013, we sat down to record an interview at Castle Martyr Resort near Middleton. It's an interview that we had been saving for a future project on Irish whiskey, but it seems right to hear from him now. First of all, tell me what Irish whiskey means to Irish culture. Gosh, that's a subject you could spend a week discussing. It, uh, it's deeply, deeply embedded in all aspects of Irish culture. Uh, we're very, very fond of the pub and have been for centuries. And uh, for a man to go of an evening after a good day's work to the pub, to have a pint of Guinness and uh, a couple of glasses of whiskey, and then go home to the family is the most uh, normal and agreeable way of spending an evening. Whiskey means something in a whole range of things, celebrating events like uh, weddings and uh, anniversaries. Uh, whiskey at a wake is an important thing as well. The Irish still believe in the wake spending a day or two days of uh, remembering the great, great qualities of somebody who just recently died and to raise a glass to his memory. So whiskey is everywhere in Irish culture. And how did your family get started in the business? Gosh, it goes back a long way. In 1791, uh, James Power founded his distillery in John's Lane in Dublin. His son, who became Sir John Power, made it big and successful during the 19th century. Sir James Power was the third generation, and Sir James Power has six children, three boys and three girls. Two of the boys inherited the distillery and uh, were the proprietors in the 1890s right through to 1930. They both married, but as luck would have it, their children all died young, so they didn't have any, any inheritors to pass the business on to. But their, two of their sisters had married respectively, a man called O'Reilly and my grandfather, Major General Thady F. Ryan, and they had lots of children. And so in the 1890s, Uncle Jim, as he was known as, Sir James Talbot Power, invited a number of his O'Reilly nephews and his Ryan nephews to join him in the distillery. And among the Ryan nephews were my grandfather, Willie Ryan, and two of my granduncles, John Ryan and Thay Ryan, and then Willie Ryan's two sons, my own father, John A. Ryan and Clem Ryan, and then finally myself as the seventh generation. I'm, I'm a bit of a dinosaur because I've got no sons, and uh, so I'm the last of the power descendants to work in the industry. When I graduated from Trinity College, Dublin, my father asked me did I want to come into the family business, John Power and Son. And I said, no, I said, I prefer to go and stand on my own feet for a while and maybe come back later. He said, fine, a very good idea, he said. So I went to England and I worked with Ford Motor Company in car marketing for five years. And while I was away in England, this merger took place and I said, whoops, there goes forever any chance of me getting back in on a, on a nepotistic basis. But I watched carefully the evolution, the new evolution of the new company. And I heard that they had appointed a new managing director, a man called Kevin McCourt, and he was setting up an export division. So I wrote to him and I said, forget that my name is Ryan, but I've done this, this and this with my life and I have some marketing experience and I'd be, I would love to join your international division. So he gave me a couple of tough interviews 
and I happily joined the company then in, in 1969 with some marketing skills to bring that forward. And uh, so that, um, that was how uh, somebody who wasn't in the business before 1966 managed to scramble into the business in 1969. And I was the first ever young export salesman, the first ever young leg man, if you like, to go overseas and propose Irish whiskey to markets overseas. And in those days, we had very little to offer. The only thing in our favor was Irish coffee, which is a very nice drink, but putting it into coffee masks or hides the true subtlety of the whiskey itself. And it took the best part of 20 years to persuade people to drink Irish on the rocks or with soda or with water or in cocktails, not just in Irish coffee. Uh, to begin with, I used to go to countries and say Irish whiskey or whiskey Irlandais to the French. The French would say whiskey Irlandais, whiskey Hollandais, Dutch whiskey. No, no, whiskey Irlandais. Ireland had, was, had a very low profile in those days. So we just had to start from scratch. And when I first started, our total export sales of all brands was 127,000 cases. And now it's about 5 million cases. So I, in my retirement, can look back with a certain amount of satisfaction that I helped sow some of those seeds 40 years ago, which seeds are now bearing excellent uh, results now. What was it like trying to sell Irish whiskey back in those days when you had literally limited amounts of production mm -hmm. and only a handful of distilleries and not much of a reputation anymore that it pretty much died out after Prohibition? Yeah. We were starting from scratch in essence. And as I say, Ireland itself had a very low profile in many countries, and the idea of Irish whiskey uh, was virtually unknown outside America. In America, uh, Irish, well, you were starting from square minus 10, because people said, Irish, that's rough and harsh and fiery, isn't it? Because during Prohibition, stuff had been sold pretending to be Irish whiskey, which in fact was rubbish, was bathtub liquor, which had never seen the light of day, let alone the Emerald Isle. And so even in the 1970s, in America, Irish had a reputation of being rough and harsh and fiery. So we had to say, no, no, you've got to taste it. Taste our new Jemison North American blend and see how you like it by comparison to Scotch and bourbon. So with comparative tastings, gradually, bit by bit by bit, people began to realize that, oh, no, this is quite nice, this new style, lighter style of Irish. And gradually, bit by bit, it won success, first of all, in America. Ireland's profile in Europe increased dramatically when in 1972, Britain and Ireland became full members of what was then called the European Economic Community, which subsequently became the European Union. But in 1972, when Ireland joined, the French and the Dutch and the Belgians and the Italians looked around and said, ah, oh, Ireland, let's learn about Ireland. So our profile increased and our products, like Irish whiskey, came to people's foreground. Another great help in the 70s and in the 80s was the popularity of the Irish pub overseas. Uh, clever entrepreneurs, usually Irish, opened, uh, let's call them fake Irish pubs, but imitation Irish pubs in Paris and Bonn and, uh, and Berlin. And this heightened the awareness for Irish drinks in general, like Guinness and like uh, the range of Irish whiskies. That all helped to increase the profile. So gradually, bit by bit, very slowly, over a 40-year period, people discovered Irish for themselves and discovered it, it tasted good. And from there on, I'm glad to say we haven't looked back. Tell me about the, uh, the genesis of Irish distillers in 65. Uh, 66, actually. 66. Um, or ever since the introduction of Prohibition in America, and also the, when Ireland left the British Empire and the British Commonwealth, when it became independent in 1922, both of those features destroyed the export trade of Irish whiskey. Before then, Irish whiskey had dominated in the British Empire markets and indeed in America, but suddenly it couldn't be exported there anymore. So many of the smaller distilleries closed down. There had been more than 140 licensed distilleries at the peak of the 19th century. And by, the, by 1950, it was down to five distilleries. And three of those five, well, one, one of those five, Tullamore, joined Powers in the early, late 1950s. And then in 1966, three of the remaining distilleries, John Jemison Son, John Power and Son, and Cork Distilleries Company, decided to dig a hole and bury the hatchet of competition, which had been going on for the previous 200 years, because they realized that there wasn't going to be a future for the Irish whiskey industry unless they got together and stopped wasting their 
time and effort and energy and money and manpower competing against each other in the domestic market and set out to relaunch, re-present, reintroduce Irish whiskey to the markets of the world. So that was the purpose of that merger. But it led to the end of your family's distillery. It led, when, uh, led to the end of the independence of John Jemison and Son and John Power and Son and Cork Distillers. But the sum of the parts has turned out, as we all know today, to have been much, much more worthwhile. From 1966 right up to 1988, we struggled manfully to relaunch Irish whiskey through the medium of the brand Jameson. Um, there was no question that it had to be Jameson. My family would have loved it to have been Powers at the time, but in essence, Jameson was the best known brand internationally. So it was a bit like having, a bit like having five horses in a race, the Jameson horse, the Power horse, the Paddy horse, the Tullamore Dew horse, and the Bushmills horse. The race had already started and you could still bet. And Jamison was the leading horse. It, it, was a, it, it took no decision to realize that Jamison had to be the brand. And, thank God, Jamison has now turned out to be spectacularly successful in world markets. And now, at last, Powers time has come in the international markets. Powers remains a very important brand here in Ireland. It was and still is the leading selling brand of Irish whiskey in Ireland. We call it the Irish the Irish prefer. But now his time has come in the international markets too. You were around at the time that uh, the distillery closed on John's Lane. That's right. That was a, a difficult time period, not so much for me personally, but much more so for my father and my uncle Clem Ryan, who were the people who'd run that distillery for a whole generation. The essence of the problem was that both the Jemison Distillery and the Powers Distillery had been built in 1780 and 1791 in what was then the outskirts of Dublin City, but Dublin City had grown around them, and suddenly the two of them, both distilleries, were faced with a problem. There was no room for expansion, and in fact, the only thing to do would be to start again on a greenfield site, and so the obvious thing to do was to pick a greenfield site, and Middleton County Cork was the site of one of the old distilleries, alongside of which the company owned several hundred acres, so that was the obvious site also because there was an excellent supply of water from the Dungourney River, which had supplied the old distillery for 150 years without, uh, without loss of, uh, of water. And so once that decision was taken, the very difficult decision was taken to close down the old Jamison distillery and the old Powers distillery. Powers distillery has actually kept going for one whole year for insurance after New Middleton started in 1975, they distilled right on until 1976, but during that year, New Middleton proved itself perfectly, and so sadly, the old Powers Distillery was sold, and is currently occupied by the National College of Art and Design in Ireland. So all the students of art and design now work in the old distillery, surrounded by some of the wonderful old vats and vessels, and the old pot stills are still there in the old distillery. Do you ever go back over to the college occasionally just to look around? Just occasionally for old time's sake. And uh, half of me, of course, is very sad that it's no longer a distillery, but the other half of me is very happy to see it occupied in a new role, you might say, by those students coming and going every day and keeping the spirit of the place alive. They've really made uh, some interesting changes with those buildings, haven't they? They have. And, but the very fact that there were those fine big buildings which could be made into enormous uh, display halls and uh, galleries and uh, lecture theatres, it was the ideal place for uh, the College of Art to go. Uh, they, they had been housed next door to the Parliament House in Kildare Street, beside Leinster House, and the Parliament wanted to expand, so they were trying to get rid of the, uh, the, uh, the National College of Art in 1979, and so in 1980 they came and took over Powers Distillery. Sad, but a new use for it, and I'm quite happy about it. Tell me about uh, the uniqueness of pot still whiskey. It, it, mm. Because it... It's made in the same kind of stills that we see in Scotland, of course, but it differs. The main difference is that in Scotland, they make their mash out of 100% malted barley, and in almost all cases, the malted barley is dried over a peat fire, imparting a peaty, smoky flavor to all Scotch whiskies, to a greater or lesser extent. In Ireland, we mix together malted barley and unmalted barley before the brewing, mashing, and fermentation takes place, and the, the malted barley we use is never peat-dried, it's just kiln-dried. 
Now, the mixture of malted and unmalted barley adds a sweetness, a lightness, almost a delicacy to the final whisky. Malt whisky of its nature is, in Scotland is quite pronounced, it's quite assertive. Uh, it, uh, when you're drinking malt whisky in Scotland, you have to concentrate on it because it demands your attention. Whereas the, more, the, the pot still whiskies in Ireland are more smooth is the wrong word, they're more rounded, their complexity shines through in a more elegant fashion. And uh, that is the way that Irish whiskey used to taste in the 19th century and the 18th century. And we believe that a, a well-distilled uh, single pot still of whiskey today uh, will, is already finding, uh, finding delight among serious whiskey consumers around the world. So the mixture of malted and unmalted barley before uh, the mashing and fermentation and distilling takes place is the real key to the secret between the difference between single pot still whiskey in Ireland and single malt whiskey in Scotland. But you do use other grains too, like rye and a little bit of not, corn? Not, not for the single pot still whiskies. They're okay. all made from malted barley and unmalted barley. Okay. For the lighter uh, whiskies that go into a Jamison, for example, yes, there are, there are other, uh, there's wheat, uh, sometimes maize, uh, sometimes, there used to be oats and rye, but the oats and rye were used more for, for to help the filtration process in the mash tuns rather than to add flavor. The true flavor that we recognize in whiskey comes virtually entirely from barley, malted and unmalted, which is Ireland's natural grain, anyhow. Who gets the credit for inventing whiskey in the first place? Yeah. The Irish or the Scots? We claim with passion it was the Irish. The story that has come down to us is that Irish monks bringing Christianity to Ireland in the 4th, 5th, 6th century AD also brought with them a small earthenware vessel called an alembic, which they discovered in, in Arabian countries being used for distilling perfumes. And as somebody rightly said, the Irish soon found a better use for the making perfumes, and they discovered that if they made a mash of barley and water and fermented it, and then distilled it in this uh, alembic, that a, uh, an almost magical elixir, which they called Ishkabaha, was created. And Ishkabaha are the Irish words for the water of life. And uh, that's the oldest uh, name in, in the world languages for Ishkabaha, the water of life. In France, it's Eau de Vie. In Germany, it's Lebenswasser. In Scandinavia, it's Aquavit. In Italy, it's Aqua di Vita. In Spain, it's El Agua de la Vida. All of these mean the water of life. But Ireland's Ishkabaha was the or original of them all. And it's certainly a fact that when students came to what was then known as the Island of Saints and Scholars. Between the 6th and the 9th century, they came to study God's words in the monasteries in Ireland, and they also learnt about Ishkabaha, which is used primarily as a, as a medicine in those days. And uh, when they returned to their own country, it's nice to imagine them returning with a book of God's words under one arm, and maybe a bottle or three of Ishkabaha under the other arm. Somebody once put their hand up and said, John, was that the start of the duty-free business? <laughs> it was certainly the start of Irish whiskey exports as we know it. Whiskey Quarterly editor Dominic Rosgrow tweeted this after we heard about John Ryan's passing. Quoting now, one of my whiskey heroes. He introduced me to Irish whiskey when I was in trade journalism in the early 90s. I'll never forget him taking us to a staunch Republican pub near Cork and leading the singing of Irish rebel songs while sharing a couple of bottles of Jameson with our hosts. With a voice like John's, that must have been one hell of a night. That's Whiskey Cast In Depth, brought to you by Lagavulin, the legendary Isla Single Malt. Look for the classic 16-year-old, the Distiller's Edition, and the new 8-year-old Lagavulin at a whiskey shop near you. Find out more at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. I had the chance to taste some interesting craft whiskeys from distilleries around the U.S. this week. Colin Keegan at New Mexico's Santa Fe Spirits has produced a unique American single malt. Cole Keegan is made with mesquite smoked barley, and the single barrel sample I tried was bottled at 59% ABV. The nose has soft mesquite smoke, honey, soft spices, a touch of sawdust, grilled chicken, and warm tortillas. 
It reminds me of the mesquite smoked chicken fajitas we used to get many years ago when we lived in Houston. The taste is smoky and sweet, with touches of maple syrup, clove, chili powder, mesquite seasoning, honey, and vanilla. And the finish is long, smoky, and spicy. This one is a really good example of a regional distiller creating a whiskey that's unique to the area with local flavors. And I'm scoring the Santa Fe Spirits Colkegan Single Malt a 90. The folks at Kansas City's Union Horse Distilling also created an unusual whiskey. They blended together their weeded bourbon and American single malts to create rolling standard Midwestern four-grain whiskey. It's bottled at 46% ABV, and the nose has notes of roasted almonds, maple wood smoke, a hint of spices, honey, vanilla, and blackberry jam. The taste is thick and spicy with cinnamon, black pepper, honey, almonds, and just a hint of fruit in the background. The finish is long, and the spices fade away nicely to reveal touches of baked fruits. It's another good example of a craft distiller trying to do something unique instead of reinventing the wheel. I'm scoring Union Horse Distilling's Rolling Standard a 92. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, our tasting notes are brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery, where they're making room in the trophy case after the San Francisco World Spirits Competition. The best bourbon, Henry McKenna Single Barrel. The best small batch bourbon, Elijah Craig Small Batch. Just more proof of Heaven Hill's pedigree for making whiskeys with award-winning flavor. Meet the family at HeavenHillDistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. Thursday night, our good friend David Fenkel invited me to take the night off from working with whiskeys to tasting some for fun at a John Milroy selection tasting in Philadelphia. The Shane family, which ran the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society's U.S. chapter for many years, is importing the John Milroy Selection range from Berry Brothers and Rudd into the U.S. The single casks are picked by longtime Berry Brothers whiskey guru Doug McIver, who's one of the best in the business. Now, why is that important? Well, there's likely no way I would have ever tried a three-year-old Isla single cask bottling without Doug's having picked it out as something special. Skyosha, three-year-old, comes from an officially unnamed distillery, Bunahaven, and was bottled out of a refill barrel at 56% ABV. Now, that unnamed distillery, Bunahaven, isn't known for heavily peated whiskeys, but this one will change your opinion of that. The nose is full of peat smoke and iodine, a hint of heather, and not much else. The taste is full of intense peat and iodine, along with black pepper and dried chili peppers. The spices fade quickly, leaving the peat smoke and iodine for a medium-length finish. Water does tame this beast down just a bit, and it's really a throwback to what young Isla whiskeys probably tasted like a long time ago. I'm scoring the John Milroy Selection Scotia an 87. At the other end of the scale, let's look at the 25-year-old Blair Athol single cask from the John Milroy Selection. This one was distilled back in 1991 and bottled last year from a refill hogshead cask at 54.1% ABV. The nose has notes of butterscotch, allspice, vanilla, and just a hint of citrus. The taste is oily and soft at first, then turns peppery and intense with allspice, white pepper, and ginger, balanced by sweeter notes of honey, vanilla, and butterscotch in the background. The finish is long and peppery, and this one gets high marks for complexity and balance. I'm scoring the John Milroy Selection Blair Athol 25-year-old single cask a 93, and thanks again to David Fenkel for making me take a night off to relax and enjoy some whiskeys with good friends. I'm adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of nearly 2,200 different whiskeys at whiskeycast.com. Redbreast fans have always cherished our whiskey's sherry notes, so we set out to embellish that character. Introducing the Redbreast Lestow edition. 
a quintessential single pot still Irish whisky finished in first fill a la Rosso Sherry casks from Spain's prestigious Bodegas Listeo. Carrying Redbreast trademark pot still spices and dark dried fruit notes, the Listeo edition is graced with an enduring sherry finish that would be better described as a final act. Discover the newest branch on the Redbreast family tree. Let's open up the inbox now for this week's Your Voice, brought to you by Lot 40. As we've noted before, producing Whiskey Cast has become a full time job through Cask Strength Media, our family owned media production and consulting business. Donald Hanna in Canada tweeted this note to us Saturday morning You work hard, you need some downtime. I will fill in for you on weekends if you like. I have been practicing, responsibly, of course. I think a good segment would be, what is the best breakfast whiskey? Well, Donald, thank you for the kind offer. I'll tell you what, you do your research on those breakfast whiskeys, and we'll see about having you on the show to discuss it, okay? By the way, if you'd like to read what the rest of the family considers to be the true origin story behind Whiskey Cast, they wrote it up a while back and locked it so I can't change anything. And there's a link to it in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. On that job thing, Stone Kettle tweeted the other day, You can get paid for drinking whiskey? Seriously, is this a great country or what? And not quite. As our managing director and my business partner at Christina CSM pointed out, you actually get paid to share the stories of whiskey. The drinking is a benefit. I know. I wrote your job description. Enough said. Last weekend, I mentioned the new George Dickel Tabasco barrel finish, and the Whiskey Fairy delivered a sample of it on Friday. I have not yet tasted it, but did post a photo of it on Twitter. Jason Hauser, at Whiskey Slayer on Twitter, had this response. I am intrigued by this one, as I love whiskey and hot sauce, but together, we'll look forward to your review on Whiskey Cast, Mark. And finally, our friend Louise Schiavone decided to try and stump me the other night with this tweet. Okay, Mark, identify this rare spirit. Sweet, slightly musky vanilla with light cherry overtones. And followed up with, okay, hang on, here's one more. As of today, federally patented, part of the description, combined with the smell of a salted wheat-based dough. Well, this one stumped me. Do you have any guesses? Turns out the last word in that description should give you a clue. It's not a whiskey. It's Play-Doh. If you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world... You can always post it on the Your Voice page at whiskeycast.com. Or you can do like Louise did and have some fun with us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast. And the email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Your Voice is presented by Lot 40, Canada's award-winning 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40 unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Let's wrap things up now with Behind the Label, our inside look at some of the science, history, and other stuff that makes whiskey unique or could help you win a bar bet someday. We throw around a lot of terms when it comes to wood and whiskey. Words like first fill, refill, hogshead, butt, and a lot of times these days, virgin oak. And all of those terms could be a bit confusing if you're just starting to learn about whiskeys. So let's explain just what some of these terms actually mean. For instance, virgin oak. You won't hear that reference ever with bourbons, since by law, all bourbons have to be matured in new or virgin oak barrels. That term is more used for scotch and other whiskeys to describe a brand new barrel that's never been used for anything before. Of course, after a barrel has been used for bourbon, it still has a lot of life left in it. And by the way, the same new oak rule applies in the U.S. for wheat, rye, and malt whiskeys too. 
Those barrels usually wind up with whiskey distillers around the world, along with other users. And in the whiskey world, the term first fill is used for the first time a barrel is filled with their whiskey. After that, it'll be referred to as a refill barrel when it's used again. Hogshead, butt, and pipe refer to the size of a barrel. But usually refers to ex sherry casks that hold between 475 and 500 liters of liquid. And the term pipe almost always refers to port wine casks that hold anywhere between 550 to 650 liters of liquid. Hogshead? Well, that's a bit more complicated. They're generally made by starting out with three used bourbon barrels. A cooper will break one barrel down completely then take some of the staves from that barrel and use them to make the other two casks wider by inserting a few of the staves while putting larger hoops and heads in place. The idea is to build a cask that holds about 25 to 50 liters more whiskey while keeping the barrel the same height. For distilleries that use the traditional dunnage-style warehouses, where barrels are stacked three high on top of each other, that gives you an increase in storage capacity while keeping the overall space between each row of barrels the same. If you have a question about whiskey that you'd like us to dig into for Behind the Label, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com and get in touch with us. That's also where you'll find links for our WhiskeyCast HD videos and the WhiskeyCast Tasting Panel podcast brought to you by the Whiskey Exchange along with the latest whiskey news, events, cocktail recipes, our lists of great bars and whiskey shops around the world, and, of course, a complete archive of past episodes. Our Cask Strength Conversation continues all week long online. Look for us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast. Our email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. This is whiskey, Johnny Walker's Scotch whiskey. From this place and these people, I, Scotch Makers, creating the bold and complex flavour of Johnny Walker Black Label. Step right up. Whiskey Cast, brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, know Redbreast. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2018, and comes to you twice each week from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening. <laughs>